There have been thousands of comic strips that have been printed over the years, but one stands out as a clear outlier in the sea of cartoons, Calvin and Hobbes. Talking cat enthusiast Professor Jelly here. During its short 10 years of publication, Calvin and Hobbes carved out a legendary spot in the world of cartooning, but why almost 30 years later is it still such a universally loved comic? The story begins when after years of failing in advertising, political cartooning, and countless other strips, creator Bill Watterson finally happened upon the characters that would become his masterpiece. Calvin and Hobbes were originally just side characters in a comic called In the Doghouse, but were singled out as the strongest personalities, and when Bill created the standalone series based around the titular six-year-old and his stuffed tiger, it became a near instant success and within a year was in 250 newspapers. Unlike most other comic strip characters who were reduced to nothing more but scaffolding for the cartoonist to deliver a pun, Calvin and Hobbes had legitimate personalities and Watterson was genuinely interested in telling genuine stories with these characters. At times the strip could be straight up philosophical, at other times it could be straight up childish. This dichotomy would come to be loved by an ever-growing fan base, and has been analyzed much better by other people. But what I think is so interesting about Calvin Hobbes, perhaps even more than the art itself, is the struggles that Bill Watterson went through behind the scenes that produce his vision. Notably, from the syndicate's pressure to merchandise the strip. See, unlike basically every other intellectual property ever created, Watterson actually fought against merchandising. Unlike another comic strip that happens to feature a talking cat, but th that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> Bill later said, I wasn't against all merchandising when I started the strip, but each product I considered seemed to violate the spirit of the strip, contradict its message, and take me away from the work I loved. If my syndicate had let it go at that, the decision would have taken maybe 30 seconds of my life. And that's a decision that's a lot easier to make when you're not at the level of success that Calvin and Hobbes was at. Some people estimate that the lost revenue from that is in the hundreds of millions. But you can also see why he would think that merchandising could hurt the integrity of the series. A point that is probably best explained by the infamous, very much unauthorized, very much illegal Calvin Ping stickers that pollute the bumpers of beat up trucks at your local gas station. As a kid, I thought that there's no way that this is supposed to be Calvin. This has to be some other cartoon, but it, it, it is, it is. I don't know what it is about this image that stimulates the monkey brain of the knuckle draggers who buy this bumper sticker. But whatever it is, it works. <laughs> it works well. Bill Watterson later said, I clearly miscalculated how popular it would be to show Calvin urinating on a Ford logo. These merchandising struggles and other pressures from the syndicate soon began to wear on Bill. And in an unexpected move, after years of struggling to actually get a job being a cartoonist, Bill stopped producing the comics, taking a nearly year-long sabbatical, declining all press and award shows, and moving to New Mexico. This was an unprecedented move that showed just how successful Calvin Hobbes had gotten. If any other cartoonist even thought about taking a break, they would have been immediately fired. But Calvin and Hobbes was so popular that Bill was able to take an indefinite vacation while the syndicate charged full price for Calvin and Hobbes reruns because the newspapers knew that if they dropped the comic, they would lose business to their competitors. When Watterson did come back, it was clear that he was going to be leveraging his power artistically much more now. See, most comics are drawn in this manner. Left to right, set up, punchline. And that's if they even get that much space. Bill hated this. Remembering the original days of comic strips when the cartoonist would sometimes receive an entire page to work with. Bill felt that this already limited the amount of space, which always seemed to keep shrinking, eventually turned every comic strip into a lazy copy of each other, telling the same tired jokes ad nauseum. When he came back, he stated from that point on that the Calvin and Hobbes Sunday strip would be a full-color, half-page block becoming only the second cartoonist ever to successfully request more space. But what was even more important than the space was the fact that this half page was supposed to be completely untouched. In no way, shape, or form was the newspaper allowed to rearrange this solid block of cartooning. This specific detail may not seem like that big of an issue, but it infinitely increased the artistic ability that Watterson had. And some of the most creative Calvin and Hobbes comics come out of this period. As an example, these comics could not be possible if the sections were chopped up and moved around to save space. Only in the self-contained box and fully presented did they actually work. And for standing up for his work and expanding the artistic ability in his media, Bill received some passive-aggressive comments from other cartoonists. <laughs>
Some of his peers thought that the size requirements and sabbaticals, which were actually requested by the syndicate to keep Watterson from burning out, showed a perceived arrogance and laziness. Even Bill's original inspiration to get into cartooning, Charles Scholes of Peanut said, It's his business to do what he wants to do, but it's a puzzle to me. What a blockhead! <laughs> But Bill stuck to his guns, and despite threats saying that he was going to lose most of his distribution, in the end, only 15 papers stopped carrying Calvin and Hobbes, out of the thousands that did run it. These high-profile disputes with the comic industry cemented Bill Watterson as a stalwart of artistic freedom, and continued to amplify the legacy of his work. But nothing lasts forever. After his second sabbatical ended in 1994, Bill sent the following public letter out. Dear Editor, I will be stopping Calvin and Hobbes at the end of the year. This was not a recent or easy decision, and I leave with some sadness. My interests have shifted, however, and I believe that I have done what I can do within the constraints of daily deadlines and small panels. I am eager to work at a more thoughtful pace, with fewer artistic compromises. I have not yet decided on future projects, but my relationship with Universal Press Syndicate will continue. That so many newspapers would carry Calvin and Hobbes is an honor I'll long be proud of, and I have greatly appreciated your support and indulgence over the last decade. Drawing this comic strip has been a privilege and a pleasure, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity. Sincerely, Bill Watterson. And on the last day of the year in 1995, the final issue of Calvin and Hobbes was printed, showing the two characters looking forward to a bright future. In the years since, the strip has reached the magical point of stature in the cartooning world, and has gone on to inspire a generation of artists to express their storytelling abilities. And while many people have written about the artistic journey that Bill Watterson took to create this series, I think that he says it best. The truth is, most of us discover where we are headed when we arrive. At this time, we turn around and say, yes, this is obviously where I was going all along. It's a good idea to try and enjoy the scenery on the detours, because you'll probably take a few. What'd you say, Diogenes, the non-copyright talking tiger that may or may not be all in my imagination? They need to subscribe. Well, I mean, you don't want to make him mad. I mean, he, he's a talking cat.